This is Climate Positive, a show featuring candid conversations with the leaders, innovators, and changemakers driving our climate positive future. I'm Chad Reed. I'm Hillary Langer. And I'm Gil Jenkins. Oil is like one of the most energy dense things on the planet, and it's 5.8 billion BTUs for a barrel of oil. So it's no mystery why we use oil as we do. I mean, it's incredibly energy dense, but boron power is about a trillion times more dense than that. For decades, many have called nuclear fusion the holy grail of energy sources. The undying hope is that fusion will someday provide very cheap, abundant, zero carbon electricity to all, thereby both decisively addressing the climate crisis and powering economic growth across the globe. But despite decades of well-funded research and even recent technological breakthroughs, we still seem to be years away from a commercially viable fusion reactor. So in this episode, I speak with Jim McNeil, Chief Marketing Officer of TAE Technologies, which just raised $250 million in venture financing to support the development of Copernicus, its next-generation hydrogen boron fusion research reactor. Jim and I get into the weeds on the trade-offs of competing fusion fuels, the long-standing challenge fusion must overcome to reach commercial viability, the role of fusion in our energy future, Star Trek versus Star Wars, and much more. Climate Positive is produced by Hannon Armstrong, a leading investor in climate solutions for over 30 years. To learn more about our Climate Positive journey, please visit HannonArmstrong.com. Jim, thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. Well, first, we'd like to learn a little bit more about your personal background. You grew up in Southern California, attended both the Wharton Business School and MIT Sloan, and you've worked in software development, private equity, venture capital, biotech, management consulting. Could you walk us through your your personal and professional trajectory and how you now find yourself the chief marketing officer of a company focused on commercializing nuclear fusion? I basically started my career as a devotee to the, you know, the microcomputer and I was, you know, programming in basic assembly on, you know, the VIC-20 and then the Commodore 64. And I got a job early on out of school with a company that contracted with Lucasfilm, the first nonlinear editing system. And I found myself immersed in writing code for 68,000 processors and then eventually C code doing machine control. So I was controlling video tape recorders switch effect systems, and we did the world's first nonlinear editing system. And it was great fun. It was during the time of Return of the Jedi and Empire Strikes Back and Rathacon. I mean, I didn't realize I was working at such a wonderful, fun company because I was in my early 20s, but uh, it was great fun. And then I ended up on the manufacturing side of building PCs, but I was on the software front. So I was became the senior director of advanced products at AST Research after working there for almost three years. Um, And then my career found me pursuing networking. I I basically like to get in front of major trends as they're emerging. So from the PC to networking, to local area networking, you know, to wide area networking, I wanted to be in the networking space. So I ended up helping to start a company in New York that invented client server backup called Cheyenne Software. So I was one of the founders there. And we put drives on file servers and we sold you know, hundreds of thousands of copies of software and became a billion dollar company in a couple of years and sold that to CA. And then I found myself in venture capital. I went to work at Pequot Capital as a partner and invested in software companies, which is how I happened to stumble into TAE. It was a uh, normal, you know, pipeline due diligence opportunity to look at a very interesting and novel company. And in your free time, you also produce documentaries, most recently, <laughs> Lo and Behold, Reveries of the Connected World. Hardly a side hustle. Yeah. <laughs> but tell us about that project. Well, that, that project was also basically driven by a need. The need was to take a 30-year-old company and reintroduce it to the world, or maybe I should say introduce it to the world in a way that most people would appreciate what their value proposition was. I was charged with the rebranding of a company called NetScout. Um, NetScout was at the time one of the leading providers of of network performance management and service assurance software, uh, one of the most important companies that no one had ever heard of. So as I was rebranding the company, notionally, we thought it would be interesting to explain to people 
how the internet worked and what was behind the scenes and how much we'd become to depend upon it. And I thought, would there be no better spokesperson to explore the promises and the perils of the internet more so than Werner Herzog? So we reached out to Werner Herzog to do this film and he rejected it out of hand. And then I reached out again and he rejected it. And then the third time I challenged him and I said, you know, you say you're an explorer and a pioneer and an adventurer, and yet you know nothing about this internet frontier. I just think you're afraid to go. <laughs> that got him over the hump. Uh, Werner's an absolute wonderful guy and he's a very talented filmmaker. So we created, lo and behold, Reveries of the Connected World that we premiered it at Sundance and and uh, we sold it to Magnolia and Netflix and Apple, and it did quite well. It was it was NetScout Presents, and it took our annual impressions from about two and a half billion to twenty five billion overnight. Wow! Yeah. So now I do want to jump into nuclear fusion. Before we talk about the marketing aspects of it, which you're intimately involved with, I want to first set a baseline. So for years, many have called fusion the holy grail of energy sources. The hope is that it will someday provide cheap, if not free, abundant, zero carbon electricity to all. And I imagine many of our listeners are vaguely aware of what fusion is, but don't really understand how it works and how it can play a potentially prominent role in our energy supply. So can you help us out? Yeah. Well, first, I want to check you on free. <laughs> there are very <laughs> few things in life that are free, right? We've raised over a billion dollars, you know, to pursue fusion. And so obviously that's not free. It's taken the the interest and, and the, the vision and, and the support of a lot of, of really clever individuals to do this. But to your point, you know, fusion is what makes everything on this planet possible. Everything you know, everything you touch, everything you see, everything you eat comes from the power of our local star. That huge ball up in the sky which is a million times the size of the planet Earth, is 74% hydrogen and 24% helium and other minerals mixed there. And what the star has been doing for billions, four or four plus billion years, is, is fusing hydrogen together and, and producing helium. And when you take two atoms and you, and you have the right conditions and you merge them together and you create a new atom, the energy that is produced from that comes out in the form of heat and light. And the energy that is produced is equal to the mass of those two atoms multiplied by the speed of light squared. So that's a number with 16 zeros behind it. And you know that equation, you've heard it before. That's the nature of our entire universe. It's our, our universe's natural power source is fusion. Now, what was discovered, not just by Einstein, but in the uh, late 30s and early 40s, was that you could do the opposite. You could split atoms. And when you split atoms, you create the same amount of energy, but it's, it's a fission event. It's not a fusion event. You're dividing an atom into two new parts. When that happens, it can create a chain reaction, which can result in a bomb, or it can result in the capturing of heat and converting of that heat into steam and running a turbine, which is how fission power plants work. But you know, the issue with fission power plants is if they, if they do get out of control and they continue to run, that chain reaction can cause a meltdown or can cause other damage, which is why some of the greatest engineers on Earth have figured out how to harness that power and keep it safe uh, the majority of the time. Uh, the other side effect of fission is that you're dealing with very radioactive materials because they're easier to divide because they're, they're less stable. And so you end up using things like uranium and plutonium, and they have a very, very long life of radioactivity in thousands of years. So there's a nuclear waste issue with that. There are ways of doing fusion where you don't create radioactive waste. And that's one of the things that TAE is very focused on. So tell us a little about those differentiators, particularly with your technology, but in general for fusion over fission and even other sources of energy production. What are the, the key differentiators and competitive advantages? Yeah, let, let's kind of explain you know, how, how fusion actually can happen, and then we can jump into the differences. You know, the difference between being on the sun and being on Earth is a lot. I mean, the sun is a million times the size of planet Earth. It's 98.6% of all of the mass in our solar system, just to give you an idea of how incredibly massive that star is. What comes with that mass is a tremendous amount of gravity. And so with all of that gravity, you know, atoms don't like to merge. They're repellent. You know, they have positive charges. They don't want to get together and, and multiply. 
very much unlike humans. We're very keen on multiplying. But atoms have a hard time about it. And so you need certain conditions to make it happen. So if you have a lot of mass, a lot of gravity, that's one thing. But you also need heat. Since we don't have the mass of the Earth, we have to represent that and create gravity on Earth. And we do that with magnets. We also have to replicate space. And so we create a vacuum. So you create a vacuum vessel. You surround it with electromagnets. You fill it with a gas. And you can think about different you know, forms of matter. You have, you have solids, you have liquids, you have gases, but we also have plasmas. Um, the most identifiable plasma you can see is in a neon sign, but you also see it in the solar flares and you see it in the nebulae in, in uh, telescopes. Plasmas are superheated gases you know, in the, in the millions of degrees C. And so we have to replicate that plasma in a vessel. And then we have to heat that plasma up to a point where these atoms, you know, start to get along and fuse. Now, fuels fuse at different temperatures. Deuterium and tritium will fuse at about 100 million degrees C. Deuterium is completely plentiful. There's more of it than you can possibly imagine because it's in all of our oceans. Tritium is a bit tougher because tritium um, doesn't really exist naturally on Earth. You have to breed it, and you breed it by bombarding a lithium blanket with deuterium atoms, and then you get tritium. Tritium has been produced in fission reactors for the purposes of creating weapons and in other research things, such as medical isotopes and so forth. And there's about 50 kilograms of tritium in existence today on the planet. So all the people that want to burn DDT, deuterium and tritium, because it's a lower temperature fusion reaction, are going to first have to find a source of tritium. And then secondarily, they're going to have to figure out a way to take a portion of their, their deuterium and tritium reactions and breed new tritium and capture that tritium and feed it back into the cycle. And so that is part of the challenge of running a DT reactor. And so just to level set, so deuterium and tritium are the typical feedstock that a lot of other fusion reactors will use to generate energy, basically. It's the majority of. I mean, you right. know, TAE is unique in, in two very you know, substantial ways. One is our architecture is completely unique, and I'll talk about that. And the second thing is our fuel source is is not tritium and deuterium. It's PB11 or boron. So our goal is to fuse hydrogen and boron. And the challenge is you have to be a lot hotter. The benefit is it's aneutronic. You're not producing neutrons, and you're not producing neutrons that are going to bombard the first wall of your of your reactor and then cause them to start to decay. You know, tritium has a half-life of 12 years. And so while that's much, much better than uranium and, and plutonium, it still does wreak havoc with the materials it comes into contact with. It irradiates them and then it begins this decay process. And so one of the big challenges of operating a DT fusion power plant is figuring out how to protect the power plant itself from the fusion that's taking place within the vessel. With boron, it's a lot different. Boron, the biggest challenge we have is getting to a billion degrees. And when you say these numbers, people really freak out. I mean, because <laughs> I mean, think about it. I mean, the, you know, the core of the sun is 15 million C. You know, so what, what are we talking about in terms of 100 million C or, or a billion C? We're dealing at the atomic level. I mean, these are atoms. These are tiny, tiny, tiny little things, you know? And if any of these atoms, which are at this very high energy level, these very high heat levels could interact with anything outside of that plasma, they would immediately discharge, you know, their, their temperature and their energy. See, what, what makes fusion so incredibly difficult is also what makes it very safe. If, for instance, a reactor operating in California were broken by an earthquake, it would just blow out like a candle. That would be it. Done. If you had an interruption in the power that was fueling the, the plasma, then it would just peter out, it would stop working. So there's no risk of meltdown. There's no risk of, of burnout. There's no risk of release of, of toxic gases or, or radiation or anything like that. So actually your reactor, which which operates at a higher temperature or the fuel, which requires a higher temperature, and that's why your reactor operates at that level, is actually safer than one that operates at a lower temperature? Is that the implication? That's That's a fact, yeah. yes. It's safer because of neutrons and radiation. So we don't have, like, for instance, if you look at ITER, the International Energy Experiment in France, the ITER confinement vessel, which is reinforced concrete, is three and a half meters thick, and it's 60 meters tall and 60 meters in diameter. So you have to put this huge dome 
over the tokamak reactor to shield the outside from radioactive uh, material. We don't require that. The reason you stand away from our reactor, you have a reasonable distance, is because of the magnetic fields, not any kind of radiation issues. So if you turn off a, a boron reactor, you know, people can walk up and, and do maintenance on the machine, you know, with their bare hands and, you know, wearing hard hats. So it's a very, very different kind of model. You talk about a billion degrees. I mean, CERN, the super collider, Hadron Super Collider has reached temperatures in the trillions of degrees. So, you know, thousands of times hotter than what we're talking about. Got it. So it's definitely possible to reach those temperatures. In terms of the feedstock, the the boron that you use instead of the deuterium or tritium, where, where are you getting that? I mean, where does it come from? Well, you just basically dig in the ground. <laughs> it's on the surface of the planet. The two largest deposits are in the California Mojave Desert in a place called Boron, you know, big surprise, <laughs> and also in Turkey. But it exists really all around the world, which is a really good question because Currently today, we mine about a million tons of boron a year. You know, it costs about $700 a metric ton. In contrast, if you want to go buy tritium today, it costs about $30,000 a gram. So a normal, like 500 megawatt, you know, DT power plant, you know, would require about two kilograms of tritium to operate for a year which at those costs would be about $60 million. Now, obviously, that's why they want to breed their own tritium, so they don't have to pay $60 million in fuel costs. But in a boron reactor, you could deliver a year's supply of boron in a pickup truck. And that also brings up a really interesting point. You don't need rail going to the power plant to deliver coal. You don't need pipelines to deliver gas. Um, you could drop off a year's supply of fuel with a helicopter. And also because the power plants are not radioactive in nature, you could put them anywhere. You could put them where the people are. And, and the reason that's important is because currently our model is to build, you know, large producing power plants in the you know, hundreds of megawatts and, and gigawatt level. And when you do that, like, for instance, if you have a hydroelectric dam, it makes perfect sense. You're going to run transmission wires from, you know, Hoover Dam into Las Vegas and, and you're going to you're going to spread power around those high tension wires. They take a lot of space, they take a lot of copper, and they have a lot of loss in terms of the power that leaves you know, the power plant and gets to its destination. But if you could take a power plant, let's say 100 megawatt, 200, 500 megawatt plant, and drop it in the middle of New York City or, or New Delhi, then you don't have wires everywhere. You, know, you have a much more efficient model. And that's the future that we see. You know, We don't want to build a six-story tokamak that has to run wires out to 100 miles away. We'd rather build a bunch of modular power plants so you can drop wherever you need them. I want to tell you about another podcast you might enjoy. There are trillions of dollars flowing into climate solutions. The world's largest energy firms, tech companies, and banks are putting big dollars behind climate tech. So where is a smart investment going? Catalyst, with Shale Khan, offers an authoritative guide to how we address climate change across the global economy. Hosted by veteran analyst and investor Shale Khan, Catalyst digs deep into climate and climate tech solutions with the world's top experts and helps us understand the trends that are reshaping the economy and transforming the way we power our lives. Listen and follow Catalyst wherever you get your podcasts. So you've sold me on boron over <laughs> tritium and deuterium because it requires less feedstock and it's cheaper. And there are locational benefits because it's safer, so you can site it at locations that are closer pressed to where humans are, and that obviously then allows you to have less infrastructure to connect it to the grid. And so you've sold me on that, but one of the major challenges that has plagued Fusion, obviously since its inception, is the fact that you actually require more energy input for the reaction than the output energy that you get from it. This is what is called scientific break-even. That's a misnomer. I mean, you you required more energy in than you got out of it, then obviously it's a non-starter. You know, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, that doesn't make sense. But I understand where you're coming from. You're going to talk about Q, yes. right? which is the ratio of power in to power out. And it makes sense that you need to get to a Q of, you know, five or 10 before this starts to really work, which is, you know, five times more power out than you put in. The reason this constantly comes up is that the amount of power that you need to get hydrogen up to the temperatures we're talking about is tremendous. I mean, when we create a plasma in our current machine, Norman, we're dealing with hundreds of megawatts, 500 to 700 megawatts of power 
that is used to run the magnets and, and to heat the plasma and to basically activate the, the particle beams, the neutral beams that we're using to fuel and help confine and control the plasma. You need temperature, you need density, and you need duration of plasma to be able to get to the temperatures we're talking about to start fusing energy. But it is a tipping point. When you get to that point where the atoms and the, and the fuel in your plasma cloud start to fuse, then things move in the right direction. Because remember, the amount of energy that you're going to generate from a very small amount of fuel is just tremendous. It's an insane amount of energy. Put it this way, a stick of wood is like 24 BTUs. A chunk of coal is like 175, right? That's like our history of using energy, right? And then we discover oil. And oil is like one of the most energy dense things on the planet. And it's 5.8 billion BTUs for a barrel of oil. So it's no mystery that why we use oil as we do. I mean, it's incredibly energy dense, but boron power is about a trillion times more dense than that because it's not a chemical burn. It's, it's, it's a nuclear reaction. And it's basically the way the universe is put together. Right. But let's stay on cue though for a second, because last year the U.S. Department of Energy, they have a national ignition facility. It set a fusion record. It was at the time where they got a cue of 0.7. So they're still not Q over one, right? They're still not getting a cue that's greater than one. They're still getting less energy out of the reaction than they required putting into it. And this was very short-lived. It was only for, I think, four billionths of a second. Yep. So where are you in that process for your technology? Well, first of all, let me say this. I would say that any fusion solution, whether it be DT or helium-3 or boron that gets to net energy out or a Q greater than one and figures out how to create a thermal cycle or a direct capture cycle where we can convert this energy directly into electrons is a huge boon to society no matter who does it, whether it's a national lab or it's one of our competitors. There is a absolute need for our planet to come up with a carbon-free, safe source of energy. And DT fusion is much safer than, than nuclear fission because of the nature of, of tritium. It has you know 12 years half-life versus thousands of years. So I mean, it's, a, it's a very big difference, right? So all fusion is better than any form of fission. But having said that, fission works today and, and fusion does not. So if we look at what has to be done, you know, 73% of carbon that goes into the atmosphere is coming from burning fossil fuels. And 35% of it is from electricity generation and like 38 or 39% of it's from transportation. So we need to create electric vehicles and we need to wean ourselves off of gas and coal. So we need to get there quickly. We think that our approach is much, much more efficient than a tokamak approach. And I'll tell you the main difference. If you look at a tokamak approach, which is the majority of the companies out there pursuing fusion, including including Eater and Jet and Commonwealth and others and tokamak energy, you're, you're talking about a donut-shaped reactor that is surrounded by magnets. It's a hollow donut. Instead of jelly, you fill it with a plasma, a hydrogen and you know deuterium and tritium plasma in their case. And there's also a core magnet that goes up through the center of the donut. So if you think about ring toss, this donut sitting on the pole, that pole is an array of super powerful superconducting magnets. The magnets, as I said, are used to create a gravitational force, which suspends the plasma inside of this tube, and it rotates radially around this core. And we think that that's very complicated, and you need a tremendous amount of magnetic power to maintain that. And we thought it would be much easier. Well, we, I mean, that's not... True. Norman Rostoker, who is a PhD physicist at UCI, who is the, the technology co-founder of our company, who has spent his entire career pursuing fusion with the intent of creating a commercial power plant, said, what if you take this toroidal shape and you cut it right in the middle and you stretch it out, just bend it out until it's straight into a cylinder, pinch the ends, right? So now we have a cylinder, in this case, horizontal cylinder, lay down a bottle of wine, if you will. And then take magnets and surround that, you know, with magnets. So you've got you've got less magnets, you've got less, you know, area in the cylinder. Uh, you still have the ability to control this plasma through two means. One means is the magnetic force that's being controlled on these magnets, these rings. And the other thing are the neutral beams 
that are feeding the plasma and spinning the plasma in the direction we want it to spin. And it's incredibly different architecture. And, and we have built five reactors. Norman was designed to get to a demonstration temperature of about 30 million degrees and sustain plasma. And we have developed AI and machine learning technologies that can respond you know, like in a nanosecond to variances in the plasma. We, we, we obviously monitor the plasma through multiple diagnostic tools, such as lasers and other sensors and probes. We look at how the plasma is behaving. If the plasma starts to tilt out of the way we want it to, we can make adjustments with the magnets or with the beams. And it's basically like spinning a very, very hot football using a lightsaber. <laughs> and the longer you can spin it, ironically, what happens is that the, the, the plasma tends to get more stable, the more energetic it becomes because it starts to create its own gravity and it gets hotter. Now, we have been able to sustain plasma for up to 30 milliseconds, which in, in plasma physics is an eternity. It's a lifetime. And we could go further if we were able to store more energy to keep it going, because right now the way we keep it going is through our neutral beams. And that's what's spinning this plasma. We need to have more energy to get it to higher temperatures so we could sustain it for about two or three seconds. That's what we're doing with our next reactor, which is Copernicus. Copernicus is going to be built in Irvine. We've broken ground on the new facility, and we expect to have this machine up and running in 2025. Copernicus is also a research reactor, though, right? It wouldn't be commercial operable. Correct. Yeah. Copernicus is a research reactor, which is going to demonstrate what you're talking about, which is this kind of holy grail of, of a Q greater than one. And we're going to do that using just hydrogen. Again, we tend to veer away from using tritium because we don't want to irradiate our machines. When you do that, you really can't use them much longer. I mean, that, that's what happened with JET on a couple of occasions. There's a lot of time involved in, in making the machine safe to operate again. So we're going to demonstrate using accepted principles in the plasma physics arena that we can get to an energy of greater than one using just hydrogen. And then once we do that, all of the information we collect from Copernicus will inform the design of Da Vinci, which is our first commercial prototype. And that commercial prototype will be designed to actually put electrons to the grid. And very humble names you choose as well for these reactors. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, they're, they're rebels. You know, they're people that buck the norm. You know, what we're talking about, you know, the old trope, which is, you know, fusion's 30 years away and always will be. You know, we've been at this since 1998. So if we can prove net energy out in the next six years, then we've proven that fusion is 30 years away, right? <laughs> yeah. I think we're going to do it. We have a lot of confidence based on the, the data we've collected through the operation of Norman, you know, that by using more powerful magnets and beams and more power that we can get to the temperature that we seek. And then once you can contain this plasma for a long enough time, it's going to get up to the, the billion degrees we need to get it up to. And from the beginning, what, what set TAE apart, and the reason I invested in the company back in 2000, is that the goal was always to build a commercial power plant. And so to build a power plant that is modular, you know, that you can manufacture in volume that you could put in shipping containers and ship around the world and stand them up and turn them on. It's a very, very different model than what you get with some of the large tokamaks that are currently being contemplated. Right, a more distributed model. In the commercial development, which I understand is a few years off, I mean, are you, do you have a target price dollar per megawatt hour that can be achieved with fusion reactors? Economics is what drives industry. It's what drives our whole world. And, and so if you can't create a power source that is competitive, then it's obviously not going to be adopted. We're seeing wind and solar get deployed because quite frankly, it's the lowest form of energy generation that exists today, which is great. The only problem with it is it's not dispatchable. So to get to a dispatchable energy that can compete with natural gas, you know, I'd say five cents, you know, a kilowatt, I think that's a reasonable goal. And we think we're going to be in the five to seven cent a kilowatt hour price range in the first generation machine. And that generation machine is, is just thermal capture. It's, you know, using the most advanced technology on the planet to generate energy the most old fashioned way possible, you know, by, by heating up water, and creating steam. Right. But what's more efficient in Gen 2 will be direct capture of photon energy within the reaction and converting that directly to electrons. 
Um, and it may be a combination of the two, which can bring this, you know, down well below, you know, seven cents for a nickel a kilowatt. You know, the original visionaries on fusion were contemplating energy that was too cheap to meter. The thing that's exciting about a fusion power plant is if you put it in almost any sovereign nation around the world, they're not going to have to go to war to get fuel. We mine a million tons a year. If we had 100,000 power plants in production, we would use 10% of that of today's production to provide all the electricity that the world's going to need in 2050. So Germany and Europe wouldn't be dependent on Russian gas (laughs) to heat their homes, right? What gets me excited about this is if you think about the mindset that we have as human beings, which is this mindset of scarcity. If I have it, you don't. You know, I need to take it from you so I can have it. And energy is one of the things that that people who have it take it for granted and people who don't have it will do just about anything they can to get it. They'll, they'll burn dung, they'll burn wood, they'll, they'll cut down forests, you know, they'll make charcoal out of old growth trees. They'll do all kinds of things to get to the ability to cook their food, heat their houses, let alone generate electricity. So we have four and a half billion people on this planet living without access to reliable electricity. And it's no coincidence that four and a half billion people on the planet are living on less than $5 a day. I live in in the Northeast. I live in New York. If I didn't have electricity, I'd be spending all my summer chopping wood. I'd need like 40 cords of wood to get through the winter. I don't even think about that. But around the world, that's a reality. You know, there, there are people that have to think about how they're going to heat their homes and how they're going to feed their families. When energy becomes ubiquitous and it becomes super, super cheap, you know, to the point of, you know, it's almost not even worth charging for it from a national level, then everything can change. You can have lights, you can have internet access, you can educate your kids, you can build a more informed workforce. And to think about what it's going to take to convert the thousands of power plants that are in you know, operation today rapidly to a clean energy alternative in the next 20 or 30 years, we're going to need a lot of people to do that. And it's going to build a big economic opportunity. Yeah. And and today, even today, several times more people are employed in the wind industry, for instance, than in the coal industry. So we're already creating those jobs in the renewable energy space today. But I do want to talk about how you see fusion fitting into the broader energy system with wind, solar, and and storage. You mentioned how it could displace natural gas because it's flexible, it's rampable. How do you see it as part of the broader energy system, noting that we already do have some good technologies out there that are cheap, that are renewable, that are low carbon, and that the reason that they're not dispatched for wind and solar are, are rampable in the way that we would like them to be is because, in part because you can't store the energy that is produced during the periods of high resource to use when there are periods of low resource, but that the battery technology is getting a lot cheaper as well. So how does fusion fit into our broader energy future, given our existing technology mix and, and the trajectory of it today? Yeah, well, I think it's really important to be you know quite pragmatic about fusion, right? While, while fusion, I think, is the holy grail that, you know, it is the perfect power, you know, for our planet, we get, we're on a path to get there and we have to acknowledge that we're not there yet. And so we have a path to perfect power, if you will. And the first thing we have to do is we have to really focus on efficiency. The U.S. power grid's about 40% efficient. It could be a lot better. You know, you talk about solar and wind not being dispatchable. To make it dispatchable, to make it a viable baseload power, we need to invest in all different types of storage, not just lithium-ion batteries, because those are very expensive, but hot rocks, you know, molten salts, you know, very different types of ways of storing the energy from wind and solar. But also when you look at the physics of wind and solar, even if you can make a productive farm dispatchable through storage, it's still not going to scale enough to meet the demands of the planet, which is why we're still going to be burning you know, natural gas and coal you know, for years to come. And it's still why Germany is considering extending the life of a number of fission plants that they said they were going to turn off you know, for the reasons we mentioned before. You know, they need energy. So I think that there, we, we need to take a portfolio approach to the problems that we're trying to solve. We need to plan for fusion to be part of it, but we also need to make sure that we meet the demands of of the planet today for electricity. So I think fission plays a part. I think that the new approaches to fission, you know, more modular, scaled down, more portable units, units that, you know, have a shorter half-life than what our traditional 
machines have had is, is a positive thing. And I think that we also should accelerate investments in fusion so we can get there faster than 2030 or 2040. You know, JFK said we're going to go to the moon in, in 1960, and we were there in 69. And it took 400,000 Americans and, and about $250 billion in today's money to do it. Do you see that kind of effort going into fusion around the world? No. That's what I want to talk about is the International Thermonuclear Experimental Reactor, ITER, which you mentioned a few times already, which is an international nuclear fusion research and engineering mega project, which is aimed at generating energy on Earth in the same fusion processes the sun operates on. And they're hoping to complete the first main reactor in about 2025. U.S., China, EU, India, Japan, Russia, South Korea, all the big powers are behind it. It's costs already are about $20 billion. So that's a very multinational public sector effort to create that sort of man on the moon project that, that you mentioned previously. What are your thoughts on that project and, and how do public sector investment efforts like that fit into this broader ecosystem where you just raised $250 million for TIE to build your next uh, research reactor. And those are, you know, commercial investors expecting a venture return on that. How do these two ecosystems coexist and support each other? I would say, you know, one's an international effort to do substantial research and development in the areas of fusion. And I think there's a lot of value that comes out of that in terms of what we learn from their experiments. But it's also a very large bureaucratic undertaking, you know, that's been through a number of directors and it's had a number of cost overruns and, and time overruns. If you take a look at pursuing fusion, you know, the way we do it, I mean, we're much more a technology company, a California agile technology company than we are a national laboratory. If you compare the 400,000 people and the 25 billion 60s dollars that put a man on the moon, to, you know, say SpaceX, which started in 2002 and put its first rocket in space in 2008, you know, at considerably less money, and now is actually landing rockets on barges autonomously. You get a lot more done when you have a very focused team of capable scientists and engineers. And, and we have a very, very narrow mission, and we have a very narrow architecture and idea. As I mentioned, we've got a field reverse configuration architecture. We've got boron as our fuel. We have not deviated from that, you know, in the 22 years that we've been in business and we've made great progress towards, you know, that end. So it's it's a very different mentality, you know, than, than a major international project. And so are there any other applications for your either particle beam accelerator or power management systems aside from electricity generation? Well, yes. Yeah. Let's talk about, you know, the path to perfect first. I mean, if you talk about efficiency, you know, we view that the path to perfect is three major steps. It's efficiency, make the grid more efficient, support the electrification transition. Secondarily, it's, you know, prove that fusion works, which is what we're going to do with Copernicus in, in the next few years. And then thirdly, scale it out. Figure out a model where we can deploy fusion energy around the globe equitably in very rapid, rapid order. But on the efficiency front, the technology that we have developed in order to power a fusion reactor is quite substantial. Apparently, you can't call up Southern California Edison and say, hey, I need to draw down 750 megawatts in the next 50 milliseconds. You know, they, <laughs> they, they don't do that. It's, it's, not, it's not available. In fact, when you call them and tell them you plan on doing something like that, they say, by the way, you're going to need to disconnect your building from the grid which is what we've done. So in the early days, we had a couple of seven ton flywheels in the parking lot that would spin up at like 3000 RPMs. It would sound like a jet turbine. We had to put it in a big enclosure and the ground would rumble. And then we engage a clutch and you basically get out a bolt of lightning. That's pretty primitive technology, but it's kinetic energy converted into electrons. Today, what we've done and what we have developed is a series of supercapacitors and microinverters and power electronics that allow us to draw power out of the grid and store it up in, in incredible, incredible volumes, you know, as I said, up to like 750 megawatts, and then dispatch that into our reactor over the course of like 30 milliseconds. So we are putting out really huge amounts of energy in a very short period of time. And in so doing, we've created one of the most perfect sinusoidal waves, which is the feedstock for an electric motor. And that 
actually falls right into the EV powertrain category. And we've also developed ways to charge and discharge different types of battery chemistries more efficiently than, than anyone else on the planet. We filed patents for something we call pulse charging, uh, which enables us to charge standard EV batteries four times faster than what's currently possible. So if you take our, our power management technology and you apply it in the electric vehicle space, uh, we could charge faster. We could deliver a better sine wave to the motor, which makes that motor perform better, about 30 to 70% better. So it goes stronger. We can increase the range of the battery by 20% or so. And also it increases the life of the battery because we treat the battery in a more kind way. We manage impedance or the heat of the battery so that the battery actually lasts, you know, 10 to 15% longer. So I hope you're talking to Elon Musk then. <laughs> uh, well, he's welcome to license our technology. We'd be happy to talk to him. He's got some uh, activities in the supercapacitor arena because when you're, when you're doing regenerative braking on a vehicle, most of that energy gets lost in the form of heat because the battery can't collect that energy quickly enough. Unless, of course, you have our microinverter technology you can pulse that stuff into the battery and collect more of it. Or you have a capacitor, like maybe a supercapacitor, to collect that energy and then distribute it back into the battery. So that's something he's looking at. But we think we have a solution for that right now. So on the power management side, we can make the most expensive component in an electric vehicle much less expensive. We can give you a smaller motor, you can use a smaller battery, or you can get greater range or greater performance. It's up to the car manufacturer to decide how that's going to work. But if you can reduce the cost of the battery, you know, which is, you know, a third of the cost of a new electric vehicle, you know, that that's going to make a big difference in terms of making those things more affordable. We think that's really important. On the storage side of things, our numbers uh, work out to a levelized cost of storage, which is about 20% cheaper than what's currently available today. And that is through, you know, the management of, of charge and discharge of existing battery chemistries. Excellent. Well, Jim, we're almost done here, but first we have something called the hot seat. So we ask for your immediate quick thoughts to the following statements. One thing I changed my mind on is... I actually, I changed my mind on what, what's possible. You know, as, as a child of the technology industry, growing up with the, the PC and then watching, you know, the iPhone, you know, my father was a programmer for TRW and NASA, you know, he helped put a man on the moon. He had a four bit processor. Today we got 64 bit processors and quantum computers. I think if we can dream it, we can make it happen. Good answer. The person I've learned the most from is my wife. Even better answer. <laughs> when I need to recharge, I play guitar, read a book. The most insightful book or article I've read recently is book would be the overstory. Aside from Climate Positive, my favorite podcast is? Uh, well, actually, I'm probably a, you know, Radio Lab, Studio 360 kind of guy. You know, I like Radio Lab. If I weren't the CMO of TAE Technologies, I would be? A janitor for TAE Technologies. Um, <laughs> look at, Loyal to the end. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I've held a lot of jobs. I've been a CEO. I've been a chairman of a board. You know, I, I've been a programmer. I've been a product manager. I've had a lot of jobs. I've never had a job more fun than this one because every morning I get up thinking that we're going to make a difference, you know, that we're going to do something that's going to impact not just this decade, but the world for, for centuries to come. Star Trek or Star Wars? Yeah, I'm afraid I have to say Star Wars because I worked at Lucasfilm, so I don't have a choice. <laughs> We talked about the Wrath of Khan, though, too, so I didn't know. Yeah, well, you know, right, yeah, I, I mean, Wrath of Khan was definitely the best Star Trek film ever. And finally, to me, climate positive means? You know, climate positive means being a good passenger on planet Earth. It means being a responsible member of our diverse community of plants and animals and humans. Well, Jim, thanks again for joining us today. This was a great and fascinating discussion. I really enjoyed it and appreciate your time. Thank you very much. If you enjoyed this week's episode, please leave us a rating and review on Apple and Spotify, which really helps us reach more listeners. You can also let us know what you thought via Twitter at ClimatePosipod or email us at climatepositive at I'm Chad Reed, and this is Climate Positive.